Insightful Teaching with Jacob Prash on Moriel TV, where God is my teacher. All right. So good to see all of you here today. And uh, uh, we're so glad that Jacob could make it. Sorry about the time difference. I hate this day daylight savings time thing, but we're, we all have to deal with it sooner or later. Um, but let's go ahead and get started here. Let me just pray to open us up. Lord, we thank you so much for you being here with us. We know that we're two or three are gathered together, no matter if it's in person or over the internet, that you are there with us and that you can teach us from your word, Lord. We thank you so much for your holy, uh, eternal word and its guiding presence uh, that is there for us if we would just continue to study it. And so we, we thank you for the opportunity to study Colossians 2 today. And we just pray that you'd be with us and help Jacob uh, to do a good job. And we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Jacob, turning it over to you. Good evening. Blessings in Jesus, wherever you are. I know most of you will be in Europe and the UK, but we have some people in North America and elsewhere as well. Blessings in Jesus for continuing with our study in Colossians. A bit of good news, and we all need that. Pastor James Coates, who was essentially imprisoned in, in Canada for violating COVID regulations that prohibited his church from meeting, uh, was released from prison today. And of course, that was due to the prayers of many, many people. But such restrictions and such arrests of pastors, I'm sure, are a harbinger of things coming before the Lord returns. Nonetheless, we do rejoice in the fact that the pastor was released today and he's back with his family and his congregation. Thank God for that. It is, of course, St. Patrick's Day today, and we have a number of viewers in Ireland, both north and south. We, of course, wish them all a very happy St. Patrick's Day. Indeed, Kad Mila Falta. It's uh, Misha Seamus, Kad Mila Falta, Erin Gobrach or as the Protestants used to say, Aaron, go back. Nonetheless, here we are for St. Patrick's Day, wishing our Irish friends every blessing in Jesus. Let us continue, please. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Galatians, to the book of Galatians. Now remember, Galatians is about, I'm sorry, the book of Colossians. Colossians is about Jesus Christ in relationship to the church. It's about the person of Jesus in relation to the church. Its partner is uh, Ephesians, but also elements of Galatians. So we're looking now at Colossians, but in verse 5 of the first chapter of Colossians, I was reading the Greek text again, and uh, it's very interesting that that word that we have we have is reserved for you. It is reserved for you. Catechumenin, uh, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the table's being set, and there's a place at the table with the Lord with your name on it, with my name on it. We have an invitation, and it means that there's a place already set at the marriage supper of the Lamb that has our name on it. And that's an amazing thing, but that's the reality. We have an invitation. The world is not invited. The harlot church is not invited. But the faithful believers are indeed invited. We have a reservation. We look at the relationship between Jesus and the church. Ephesians looked at the relationship between the church and Jesus. Colossians between Jesus and the church. Although, as we'll see, there are elements of Galatians that will apply to tonight's teaching. Nonetheless, let's look at chapter 2, verse 1. I want you to know how great a struggle I've had on your behalf and for those who are in Laodicea and for those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding 
resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself. Well, this is quite a bit, but that word struggle is a translation of a word in Greek from where we get the English word agony. It's where we get the English word agony. And it's uh, actually quite a term. Well, Paul is in prison. He's saying, and he's, he's speaking, that he's rejoicing in his suffering. But at the same time, he's rejoicing in his own suffering. He's agonizing. He's in agony over the plight of the church, specifically to this Christian community that is there uh, in Colossae, in <coughs> Laodicea, and Hierapolis. Again, these churches were very close to each other and represented an extended community. Agona, Agona, which is accus which is accusative, uh, singular masculine. He's agonizing. The apostles agonized over the church because they're the apostles of Christ. Jesus had his own agony. Paul didn't worry about his own agony when he was in prison writing this. What he was agonizing about was the church, the body of Christ. The burden of Christ for the church was on the apostles' shoulders. It was on their mind, and it was on their heart, and it was something that they literally agonized over. And Paul is agonizing over it, but let's see why. He's talking about the fellowship and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in the mystery of God's, resulting in the knowledge of God's mystery. That is Christ himself. Again, there are many mysteries in Scripture. There's the mystery of the gospel, where Jew and Gentile would be one in Christ, fulfilling the promise to Abraham uh, that he'd be the father of many nations. There is the mystery of the rapture and resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, as we've said. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. It also continues with other mysteries of a less pleasant nature, such as the mystery of iniquity or mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation. These things are mysteries. Again, the world of the unsaved will not understand these mysteries until it's too late. But what we see here is the mystery of God, the mystery of God. Now, this somehow obviously has its direct reference to the book of Revelation, chapter 10. Revelation, chapter 10. <clears throat> when the final trumpet is blown, okay, now, the final trumpet is the third of the three woes. You've got the three woes, the seven trumpets, but the final three trumpets, five, six, and seven are the three woes. After the three woes take place, something happens. It was, it was um, predicted that the faithful believers who had knowledge and understanding would know these things, Ahead of time, the world will find out after it's too late. In the days of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished. As he preached to his servants, the prophets, the mystery of God will be finished. Now, in this particular passage, we read about, concerning the mystery of God, that there are seven peals of thunder. Seven peals of thunder in this passage. Uh, he placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. That has to do with Israel and the nations. And she cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. Okay. And when he cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. And when the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand in heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, there will be a delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is fulfilled. 
we know what the seven churches are. We know what the seven seals are. We know what the seven trumpets are. We know what the seven vials are. Revelation is constructed around sets of seven. Seals, trumpets, churches, vials. We know what those things are, the text tells us. But the text does not tell us what these seven peals of thunder are. It does not tell us. They are sealed up. It'll not be made known until this particular time. But the faithful believers will already know the mystery of God. The raptured and resurrected church, of course, will know the mystery of God. This is when the world finds out. They find out too late. Now, people have speculated, debated, speculated about what those seven seals, I'm sorry, those seven peals, peals of thunder may be. We do know this, that thunder in biblical typology represents the voice of God. Remember when the Father spoke to the Son, people thought it thundered, that it thundered. The people of God, those who were the followers of John the Baptist, some of them the apostles among them who were present at the time, when the Father spoke from heaven concerning Jesus to John the Baptist, the people of God heard the voice of God, my beloved son, whom I well pleased. The other people, the Baxlin Sanhedrin and their followers and people like this, they thought it was thunder. It was just noise to them. They find out later what the thunder is. They find out after the fact. But the people of God heard what it was. They knew what the thunder was. It was the voice of God speaking certain things. Now, this has to do ultimately with the mystery of God to which Colossians chapter 2 refers directly. There is a deep, I, I don't like to use the term eschatological because it's something of a misnomer, but there is a deep second coming of Christ content in Colossians as there is in all the books of Scripture, particularly in the New Testament, well, not in certain books of the Old Testament. Colossians is no exception. The mystery of God. Remember, Colossians is about Christ relative to the church, and this mystery is Christ. It's in Christ. We don't understand certain things about him now, how he could be fully human and fully divine. We don't understand the triunity of the Godhead. There are things we don't understand that will remain mysteries to us. How can he be the visible image of the Father? <laughs> What's God like? What's Jesus like? You have you not seen me, Thomas? I've been with you. Don't you know who I am? With Philip and Thomas and so forth. Well, these things are mysterious even to us. A time is coming when they won't be. A time is coming when they won't be. Now, that can happen one of two ways. The faithful church who was here at the time, or it'll happen if we give up the ghost before the Lord comes. Remember at the martyrdom of Stephen, it says he was filled with the Spirit. He lifted up his head, and he saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father. The instant that we enter eternity, if you check out before the Lord comes, the triunity of the Godhead will no longer be a mystery. Christ will no longer be this mystery. You know, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 Unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. All right, we can understand that. But his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Paleoets. Paleoets. Well, our counselor is the Holy Spirit. Well, Wonderful Counselor, God Almighty, Almighty God, El Gabor. 
Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace, is no problem. But he's called Avi Ad. How can Jesus be called the Father? Paleo Etz. El Yibor. How can it be? How can three be one and one be three? And it's all manifested in Christ. He makes the world through Jesus as, as the Logos. It's a mystery that we partially understand now, but we will get in its totality. The world will also get it after it is too late. Churches we can get. Seals we can get. Trumpets we can get. The vile judgments we can get. Seven, 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 seven. Seven peals of thunder. Seal it up. Don't write it down. Don't write it. Just like Daniel 12. Seal these things up to the appointed time. Only the faithful believers. Only the faithful believers will understand this mystery at the third woe, at the final trumpet. Now, that final trumpet is not the final trumpet of the resurrection. The, the, the resurrection trumpet is represented by the silver trumpet in the book of Numbers. The shofar, the ram's horn, is a different trumpet. The two different trumpets, we have a teaching uh, on, on, on the silver trumpets, uh, which is the trumpet of, of the rapture and the resurrection. It's not the ram's horn. It's not the shofar. But I just refer you back to that teaching. But when this last trumpet of judgment is blown and the three walls are finished, those seven peals of thunder are going to be there. Don't write it down. It's something that's going to have to be heard. But only the people of God will hear it. The others will find out post facto after it's too late. The mystery will no longer be a mystery even to them. And they are going to say, oh, no. The truth was under my nose the whole time. I could have known the truth, but I rejected it. Now, this rejection of truth characterizes fallen man's state in the last days particularly, uh, or, or in these days particularly. You can show anybody. Every scientist knows, every geneticist knows that there's X and Y chromosomes. But the law says somebody... <laughs> whose XY can identify as, <laughs> as a female, or somebody uh, who is double X can identify as a male. Wait a minute, that's not the scientific reality. You can take the protoplasm and have it surgically reconstructed to resemble a woman or resemble a man, but the DNA in every cell of their body says they're not. Reason goes out the window. They, they just can't. They reject even common sense. They reject even common sense. The suicide rate is like 50% among transgender people. We forget about that. You don't talk about that or you're a homophobe. What this does to people just reject things that are common sense. I refer you to our old teaching I did with Dave Hunt called The Death of Reason. It's, it's, it's available on our website. <clears throat> they won't get it. They can't see a mystery because they can't see what's obvious. They can't see what's obvious. The medical evidence embryonically shows non-therapeutic abortion is murder. Those babies can survive postpartum at the ages they're being aborted. They can survive in incubators, some of them even without incubators. Medically, nobody can deny the facts except Congress, except the Supreme Court except left-wing lobbies, except the feminists. When people can't see the obvious because they refuse to do so, when people reject the obvious and undeniable because of their desire to entertain their sin, there's no way they're going to see the mystery. When it thunders, they're not going to know what it means it is not going to know. Well, thank God that there will be people who do know. But it's not written. It's a mystery. And this relates to the mystery of God. 
Again, I only mention these things relative to Colossians. It's a whole subject, of course, in itself. Let's continue. Only those who have the full assurance of understanding resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery. The assurance. Roman Catholicism teaches that if you say you have the assurance of salvation, you've committed the sin of presumption. Well, the scripture says we can know we're saved. We can have that assurance. The Fanny Cosby hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. We can know that if we give up the ghost, where we're going. If we're in the right relationship with the Lord, if we are born of the Spirit, we can know. There's a reservation with my name on it. There's a place for me at the table, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can know that. There is an assurance. Unsaved people, of course, have no such assurance unless they get saved. But as we get closer to the return of Christ, Wickedness so multiplies, it doesn't matter if you show people the truth, they're going to reject it. They will reject the truth. They're rejecting obvious scientific and medical fact now, just, just to placate their own sin. But let's look. We have a full assurance and an understanding. Believe me, unsaved people, I don't care if they're politicians, in Washington or London, they don't really know what's going on beyond a limited point. Okay. In him are the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Those who will know the mystery. Let's continue. Paul writes, for even... Though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I'm with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline in the sense of discipleship and the stability of your faith in Christ and the stability of your faith in Christ. I'm trying to look at two computers here because I've got my Greek text on the other, other laptop, and I just want to look at it. I just want to uh, look at the, the Greek word, okay? Having been rooted, erizomenoi, having been rooted, and being built up on a foundation, epokoidomenoi, en oto, kai bebeomenoi, en te pistel, faith or belief, Katos and didache, that you were taught, like the didache, or we get the word didactic. Perisotones, superseding or abounding in her in thanksgiving. And ote, it's interesting that, it, that, it, that it's the feminine. Well, we read this, the idea of the discipleship is are you built on the right foundation? Discipleship, the word discipline comes from discipleship. I don't mean the world's version of discipline. I mean God's version. The world's version of discipline is about correcting something wrong or, or, or regimenting people in the military or things like that. That is not really the, the, the actual scriptural meaning. Discipline comes from discipleship. Discipleship comes from being built on the right foundation. Being built on the right foundation. And there are many people who profess to be Christians who may have had a born-again experience at some time, but who are built on a wrong foundation. Their foundation is not Christ. I had someone send me a film clip today of some guy who was teaching that subjective Holy Spirit revelation exceeds scripture, that Jesus didn't teach us to follow him on the basis of scripture, but what the spirit leads. This is complete heresy. This is utter heresy, but believers are being sucked into it. And these two young women, sincere Christians, 
couldn't argue with this guy. They didn't have the wherewithal to refute what he was saying, and they were getting sucked into it. It was very disturbing. Now, somebody who knew the scriptures could take him on and even demolish his arguments, but he'd never admit it because he has what's known as the spirit of error. I could tell the guy had a spirit of error. None is probably given over to it. But let's continue. Therefore, you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, not Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, him in eternity. So walk in him. There is a relationship between discipline means basically the same as discipleship and walk. Our walk is our discipleship. How do we live before him? Our conduit. Our conduit is the main subject of the epistles. It's the main subject of the epistles. Now, epistles have a lot of other things, but the most recurrent theme and subject in the epistles affects how we should live and apply the teachings of Jesus in this fallen world until he returns. Having been firmly rooted, now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. Now he gets to the core of what he's agonizing about. Now he gets to the core of what is troubling him. This could be written to the church today as much as it was written to the church in his day. And in fact, in a way, it could be written even more to the church of our day. But it has an ongoing dynamic application throughout history. Let's begin in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than to Christ. Then he goes again back to something we saw in the first chapter, a Christological statement. For in him all the fullness dwells in bodily form. He's God who became a man. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. This is something that Moses and Jeremiah lamented. Backslidden Israel, when it was in a backslidden state, they'd undergo ritual circumcision. It just became a rite of passage or part of a religious culture, much the same as churches that sprinkle infants and pretend that's baptism or call that baptism. It's just a rite of passage. It's cultural. It's not really spiritual. It's cultural. It's not really spiritual. Well, they were practicing circumcision the same way, Brit Milah the same way. And unsaved Jews will still do this. Non-believing Jews will still practice circumcision for cultural reasons. They'll say the prayers and so forth, but they don't really understand what circumcision means. Well, Moses and Jeremiah tells us circumcision is a figure of a circumcised heart. It's a figure of regeneration. It is a figure of dealing with the flesh and being regenerated. Um, but people don't know that. People don't care about it. A circumcision not made with hands. When you're born again, you have this circumcision. Circumcision made people part of the nation of Israel. It made them part of the covenant people. In Christ, although God still has national and ethnic purposes and prophecies specifically for Israel, spiritually and theologically unto salvation, Non-Jews are grafted in. Non-Jews are grafted in. But the only way in is circumcision. It is not, however, a physical circumcision. It is the circumcision of the heart. Now, I accept the fact that Jewish believers and so forth um, st still do it because it preceded the law. They're not saying it's necessary for salvation. My, my own son and so forth have written me a lot, but... It's important what it means. It's important what it actually means. Some people, even non-Jews, will do it for medical reasons. There are 
probable medical benefits to it known since the 1930s. Smegma bacillus is highly associated statistically with vaginal cancer in women. And in the 1930s, it was noted that Jewish women had less vaginal cancer than Gentile women in the United States. And they put this down to the discovery that smegma bacillus um, was an active agent in predisposing women to vaginal cancer. Well, by removing the foreskin, obviously, it became more hygienic and it didn't happen. Now, I'm not talking, I'm not advocating uh, ritual circumcision or even uh, circumcision for health-based motives. Of course, I, uh, I recommend personal hygiene for those reasons, but I'm saying God told the Jews to keep the law that none of these illnesses would befall you. And even going back to the ancient world, they would have had less trigonosis, less botulism, less vaginal um, cancer and so forth because they kept the Torah. They kept the Torah that it might go well with you. Again, I am not preaching any kind of legalistic ritual circumcision. I'm simply explaining what it means physically and um, spiritually. And of course, its physical ramifications are different now than then. Pork products could kill people then because of because of trigonosis. Well, it, it's very unlikely to kill people now in, if, if the food is properly frozen and preserved and so forth, refrigerated. But it's good to know that when God told them that, there was a practical, physical, medical reason he told them that, um, which shows the importance of keeping God's law to life. Now, we're under a new law. We're not under the old law, but the principle is the same. We must live by his statutes to have eternal life. Let's continue looking at this. He's worried about the philosophies of the world, but let's pick up where we left off. Having been buried with him in baptism, when you see a coffin, a casket, when you go by a graveyard, when you see a hearse driving by, it doesn't concern you. Your funeral is over. Your funeral has already happened when you were baptized by immersion. Your funeral is a past event. Death is katargeo, rendered inoperative. Believers go to sleep, as we always say. They don't die. Death is for unsaved people. Now, when we have unsaved loved ones, that's the concern. That's the concern. But there is nothing less relevant to you or to I, if we are in Christ, than a graveyard or a morgue or a coffin or an autopsy. It doesn't concern us. Our funeral is a past event. It's already happened. Your funeral is over. It's over. You've had your funeral already. You're not going to be dead. You'll be alive in Christ. The body will come back to life. You'll reign with Christ for a thousand years, but there's no death. He rendered it katargeo, inoperative. Now, when he did that, the power of the law died. In other words, somebody who's susceptible to infection. If somebody dies of COVID, and I've had two friends who died of COVID-related diseases, even though I admit it's all being politicized and manipulated, um, they don't have to worry about getting COVID anymore. <laughs> if somebody's going to die of a, a disease, uh, diphtheria or whatever, cerebral malaria, it doesn't matter. Uh, if they're dead, they're not going to die of it. They're already dead. Death has lost its power over the dead. Death has lost its power over us because we are dead. The old man, the old woman, the old creation has been buried. We have to look at our lives from that perspective. Now, this, of course, relates more to the book of Romans. I only mentioned it in passing because it, is, because it relates to the text of Colossians in this particular passage. So it's the baptism. Notice the relationship between circumcision and baptism. A relationship, yes, but an equivalency, not. 
<laughs> Babies could be baptized, uh, circumcised without a personal faith. You can't bury a baby unless it's dead. Uh, so baptism ha has a correspondence to circumcision as an initiation, but it is not the equivalent. It is not the equivalent, okay? Uh, baptism requires death. Let's look. In which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Whenever God speaks about biological death or any kind of death concerning a saved Christian, it is always, always a mere preface to his talking about life, okay? <clears throat> Again, if a believer gives up the ghost, that's not about their death. It's about their life. The death is for the unsaved. It's about their life. There was, it's funny, but I remember old-time Pentecostals in Britain from Wales, the older generation, they were pretty good men. There's only a few of them left now. God bless them. But the older generation of Pentecostal preachers in Wales were interesting, and they had that Welsh accent. <clears throat> and when somebody gave up the ghost in the church, <laughs> they would announce it on Sunday morning. And they would. this is what they would say. I remember them. They would say, we have wonderful news this morning. Brother Jones has been promoted to glory. <laughs> That's how they announced the death. Brother Jones has been promoted to glory. Well, they're right. They're right. For the believer, it's not about death. It's about life. Whenever God talks about the funeral, he talks about the resurrection. You go under the water, okay, buried. But you come out of the water, alive in Christ, the new creation. Boom, 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 boom. Not that the baptism saves us, but the baptism makes it experiential. Now let's look. It continues. When you were dead in your transgressions and the circumcision, uncircumcision of your flesh, the old nature, okay, the old nature characterized by smegma bacillus, something, you know, just human reproduction alone would kill people. It could it would predispose women to, to these vaginal cancers. It um, would also, what Paul says, we were all in Adam. We were all in Adam's DNA. This was not known in the ancient world, but God knew it. We were all in Adam. When someone is born, they're in Adam. When someone's born again, they're in Christ. The sinful nature is transmitted generation to generation. This is another aspect of circumcision because procreation is a mechanism for the transmission of sin from generation to generation. Therefore, that's what God had to cut away and deal with. Now, we're not talking about circumcision now. I'm simply trying to illuminate that aspect of circumcision that Colossians is talking about, okay? Well, let's look. He made you alive together with him in verse 13, having forgiven us all our transgressions. Remember, Roman Catholicism says you must atone in purgatory for your own sin. The gospel of Jesus Christ says the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. All transgression is forgiven. All of it. The gospel of Rome, of the high, Anglican High Church, of catechetical Lutheranism. These things are dangerously erroneous. But let's look. When that happens, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, 
which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This, of course, relates to Galatians. The Torah, the law of God is perfect, converting the soul, the psalmist tells us. It's there as an indictment. It's there to show us we are guilty and wholly incapable of saving ourselves and we need a Messiah. Unless law is preached, there is no grace. Unless law is preached, there is no grace. I've warned about people like Joseph Prince before who basically teaches licentiousness and he calls it hyper grace. But beware of the cheap grace salvation. Those who preach God loves you and he wants to bless you and just accept them into your heart without the conviction of sin. The Torah is an indictment. It shows through the example of Israel and the Jews the hopeless human condition and the need for a savior, Messiah, to save us from these documents that are against us. If you receive notification that you've been indicted and that you're going on trial for crimes and there's a capital sentence for the crimes, you're in big trouble. You are in big, anybody is in big trouble. They have an indictment for capital crimes of which they are guilty and can't get themselves off. The only one who can get us off is Jesus. Now, unless that is understood, there is no gospel, there is no salvation. One of the philosophies of the world that Paul is warning about is what you see happening now. Just know how much God loves you. Just put your hand up, brother. Yes, sister, I see you. God bless you. There's no conviction of sin. There's no certification. The law is a certification of guilt. The Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, will indict non-Jews as well as Jews. We've all broken it. We're guilty. Death. This is the philosophy of the world. What's the philosophy of the world? Well, today we call it being seeker-friendly, seeker-sensitive. <laughs> In the interest of being seeker-sensitive, we stop being sin-hostile. You know, I'm talking about the, the Rick Warren stuff, the cheap grace stuff. That's not the way the real gospel works. There are documentation that indicts us. We've been notified that we are going on trial legally for crimes of which we are guilty, and we have been indicted. And you see it there. And boy, you, your lawyer's saying, look, you, you're really in trouble. And you wish you could just take that document and tear it up. You could take that document and put a match to it. Well, in verse 14, that's what Jesus Christ does. <laughs> He takes that indictment against you and that indictment against me, and he tears it up. He throws it in the fire. He abolishes it. But unless we understand that, we don't understand the gospel. Now let's look further. He canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. It's not just talking about the Sanhedrin and the Roman government. There's that aspect to it. In his death, he defeated the very people who killed him because of the resurrection. But he defeated Satan. He defeated Satan. Satan did not understand that he was making it a way 
for sin to be atoned for, the just for the unjust. He didn't understand that. Something happened in the heavenlies when Jesus died sinless and God rose him from the dead. Now you've really blown it, Satan. It was a gambit. The whole thing blew up in his face. Satan's victories are always gambits. Got your rook? I got your queen. Check. Check major. Nobody has ever won a chess game against God. Not even Satan. And he's the second best player that has ever existed. Whenever Satan gets a victory, oh, he might take a rook, but he's going to lose a queen. He might take a knight, but he's going to lose a rook. Even his victories backfire. He can get the victory, but it blows up in his face. It always backfires. That's what happened on the cross. But the cross and resurrection, magnificent as it is, is only the penultimate. The ultimate is yet to come when the mystery of God is made known. The Antichrist, Satan is going to think, that's it. He wants to convince himself he won. But it's all going to backfire and blow up in his face once again. The way Jesus defeated Satan on the cross is a picture of the way Satan is going to be defeated. He's going to crucify the body of Christ. Being a Christian will be like being a Jew in the 1930s in Germany. It's a crime. If you're born a Jew, it's a crime. It's a death sentence under Hitler and Himmler and Bormann and these guys. If you're a Jew, it's a death sentence. A time will come under the Antichrist of whom Hitler is a historical shadow that if you're born again, it's a death sentence. He's going to think he won. But the whole thing blows up in his face. It's happened once and it's going to happen again. Now, of course, we know Jerusalem is where Satan got his biggest defeat thus far. It is also where he will get his final defeat. That's why you see all these things happening in the Middle East and Satan trying to destroy Israel. But I digress. Let us continue looking at Colossians. He disarmed them. He disarmed them. It came to a point where the powers of hell no longer had a weapon to fight with. After they thought they had won a victory. Check. No. Checkmate. Let's look. Now he goes back to what he was warning about. These philosophies. Paul was agonizing for the church. Me, yeah, I'm in prison, but don't worry about me. I've got Christ. I know where I'm going. If they kill me, I did. live as Christ to die as gain. God will give me the grace to handle this terrible as it is. That's not what I'm concerned about. That's not what causes me anguish. That's not why I'm in agony. I'm agonizing over you believing and being seduced by the philosophies of the world, by the tradition of men, by the elementary principles of the world in verse 8. That's what it is. Through the philosophy and empty deception. They'll take you captive. These people take captive. Joseph Prince takes people captive. Kenneth Copeland takes people captive. Bill Johnson takes people captive. Under a demonic empowerment, they take people captive. They get control of their minds and the way they think. Talk to somebody saved out of Roman Catholicism in Ireland since the St. Patrick's Day. Or talk to somebody of Irish Catholic descent in Merseyside in Liverpool. They know what they were saved out of. They know there's no way that the false 
gospel of Rome can be compatible with the true gospel of Christ. They know what they were saved out of. But you go to a church like Holy Trinity Bedlam, <laughs> they think it's okay to be a Catholic. They're Christians. It's the same as us. But wait a minute. They believe you have to atone for your own sin in purgatory. You have a different gospel. And they're bowing down to graven images and praying to the dead. <laughs> and there's one intercessor between God and man, Jesus the righteous, not Mary. And that's all different. It's not, that doesn't matter to them. They've been taken captive. They've been taken captive by the ecumenical lie. They're captive. Their way of thinking is controlled by demonic power through unprincipled men, through unprincipled men in pulpits. They are controlled. Now, Spurgeon understood this. J.C. Ryle understood this. Believe me, I'm far from the first and far from the best who understands it. True men of God have always understood this and said it. It's just that in these last days, it becomes so prolific. As we wait for the return of Christ, it gets worse. The deception is on steroids. But let's look. Let's look what it said. Verse 16, now pay attention. He goes back to it. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath day. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The law indicted us. Through the example of the Jews, it shows we need to be saved and can't save ourselves. That indicts us. But it also has a Levitical sacrificial system. This Levitical sacrificial system teaches about this Messiah, Savior, who's going to come and save us. So you've got the juridical aspects of the Torah, that condemn us, show us our sin through the example of Israel, but the Ten Commandments is universal. And then you have the Levitical. You can't save yourself, but the Messiah can come and save you. Now, there you sit indicted. The indictment against you was nailed to the cross. We die with Christ, we become new creations. The indictment is now to the cross. Remember, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Look at the book of Job. Look at the book of Zechariah. He's the accuser. He's the accuser. He won't be able to accuse anymore. The charges will be dismissed. Not that we weren't guilty but that Jesus took our guilt on himself to give us his righteousness, to justify us, and to pay for what we did. That's why the charges are dismissed, because somebody else accepted the blame. Well, why do you want to go back under the law that shows you you're condemned, that indicts you? You longed to be free from these things. Now, again, I am not addressing the issue of, 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 of culture and that Jewish believers keeping their culture and using the Hebrew feasts evangelistically to, to witness to other Jews and things like this. Paul took the vow of the Nazarite and so on. There's no problem with these things uh, as long as you're not saying it's necessary for salvation or, or, or mandatory. Uh, for discipleship or putting it on other people, particularly non-Jews. Uh, Jews or people married to Jews do it, that's no problem under those conditions. But to want to go back in bondage to the law? Gee, the charges were dismissed. I don't feel content because I'm not in trouble anymore. <laughs> what are you, crazy? 
Well, yeah, there's a lot of crazy people. They rather have religion than the gospel. They would rather have religion than the gospel. They'd rather have bondage than freedom. Well, let's look. What does it say? These things are a shadow. A shadow. The substance is Christ. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Our rest is in a person, not in a day. The day simply teaches about being able to rest in him once he atones for our sin. These feasts, the Paschal Lamb, the Yom Kippur scapegoat, they're about him. Now they have prophetic meaning for the future that we have to understand, and they have meaning for Israel prophetically still. But for us, these things are fulfilled in Christ. Let us look. He goes on. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement, the worship of angels, and the Greek is here, they're not really separate. They're connected, they're juxtaposed. Taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God. Satan wants to stunt our growth and the way he stunts it is with these deceptions. Now let's just go back up to the preface to this issue, where he sp speaks of the through the philosophy and empty deception. Historically, this has always been a problem. Always been a problem. The Desert Fathers got into Stoicism, a Greek philosophy. As I've said many times, Augustine of Hippo, who is essentially the founding force of both Catholicism and Protestantism, mainstream Protestantism, he Platonized the church. He amplified points of similar contact between Plato's philosophy and the New Testament, but he turned Christianity into a philosophy in order to accommodate the small c Christianization of the Roman Empire under Constantine. He rewrote Christianity as a philosophy. In the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas did the same thing, just as Rambam did it with Judaism, and it was done in the Islamic world. Aquinas with the Summa Theologia, he turned Christianity into an Aristotelian philosophy. The whole transubstantiation thing comes from the debunked philosophy of, Arist of Aristotle based on his primordial ignorance of, of what we know now from chemistry and physics about the philosophy of accidents and so forth. It's all nonsense. It is all nonsense that the bread and wine is transubstantiated even though it retains the chemical properties of, of, of bread and wine. No, it's the protoplasm of Jesus Christ. What these people didn't understand, of course, was what we understand now, chemistry and physics. Okay. You've got sodium and you've got chlorine. Okay. You combine them. Oh, it's sodium chloride. Look, it's salt. It's table salt. It's for seasoning your food. It's salt. No, it's really sodium and it's really chlorine. It just looks and tastes like salt. <laughs> he didn't understand chemical bonding. He didn't understand the transfer of electrons. He didn't understand any of that stuff. Ionization, he understood none of that stuff. How do you explain the fact that you've got table salt, okay, but then you get chloride 
and you get a salt sodium and you make it taste like table salt or look like table salt, but it's not really table salt. We know what it is. It's like someone holding up a pen and pretending it's a cigarette. Well, it looks like a pen, but it's a cigarette. Holding a microphone and licking it, saying it's an ice cream cone. That's the philosophy. That is Aristotelian philosophy. That is how the Roman Church in the Middle Ages came to define their Eucharist. And this is all nonsense. It's the philosophy of the world. But it predominated in the church. Let's look at the Protestants. 16th century humanism helped precipitate the Reformation. In fact, it did precipitate the Reformation. The reformers all came from humanist scholarship. It began with people like John Collett in England and Erasmus of Rotterdam, people like this, after the Renaissance, wanting to go back and rediscover Greco-Roman learning after the Dark Ages. And so they went back and they uh, would read the scriptures in the original Greek and Hebrew instead of the Latin Vulgate. And, and, and they would see th that what was being taught was wrong and the Vulgate was not a good translation. Some of them did. Unfortunately, John Calvin kept the Vulgate. It was his Bible of choice. John Calvin kept the Roman Catholic Latin translation of the scripture from Jerome. That was his body. Well, why did he do that? Well, Augustine used it. He, he never abandoned it. Luther kept so many of the ideas of Roman Catholicism. Why? Well, Augustine. Calvin would write in his institutes by the authority of Augustine, as if Augustine had doctrinal authority. Augustine had no doctrinal authority, only the apostles did. Be that as it may, that's what they taught, the philosophies. People are taken captive by the philosophies. They're persuaded by men. And these men can become quite unprincipled. Like over 200 people being burned alive in Calvin's Geneva by Calvin's government. Or the witch hunter general in, in, in Puritan England, or they didn't the Puritans did in Salem, Massachusetts, in colonial America. They can be quite brutal, unprincipled. But they claimed to be Bible-believing Protestants. They were taken in by philosophy. I pointed out many times that philosophically, Calvinism and Islam are two sides of the same coin. Their first cousins uh, look a lot alike. In Islam, it's inja Allah. Anything that happens is Allah's perfect will. In Calvinism, it's predestination. If God created you to torture you forever in hell, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> God created you to be saved, that's what's going to happen. This, this, why? Why? Because they are not theologies, they are philosophies. Calvinism, Reformed theology, is 16th century humanist philosophy masquerading as first century Judeo-Christian theology. It's easy to pick on the Roman church, and justifiably so. The Greek Orthodox Church, similarly, with their fathers like Chrysostom and so forth, okay. But mainstream Protestantism is no less guilty. Look what's become of it. What was the next philosophy to overtake Protestantism? It begins in the 19th century, German rationalism, liberal theology, higher criticism, Wellhausen's theory of Pentateuchal sources. Nobody can believe in miracles in the age of a light bulb, wrote and taught Rudolf Boltman. And people studying for the ministry were taught these things, thinking it was theology. All it was was philosophy, 19th century German rationalism. 
It doesn't matter if it's Aristotelianism. It doesn't matter if it's higher, the higher criticism that comes from German rationalism. The German rationalism stuff is not beholden to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Paul. It's beholden to, to, to Immanuel Kant and Nietzsche and people like this. <laughs> the philosophies of the world. This is what caused Paul agony. By the Holy Spirit, he saw what was happening even then, and he understood how it would wreak havoc through the church historically, but it would apex before the return of Christ. Well, let's look what's happening. What is the philosophy now? Well, Philosophy now is certainly consumerism. What did the, uh, Copeland and Hagen and Benny Hinn and Joyce Meyer, what, what are they teaching? Consumerism. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. Give us your visa card. Just do this and God will bless you. It's just consumer. It's the philosophies of the world masquerading theology. It has always gone on. Now let's look at verse 16 to 18 again. Let no one act as your judge in regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. The direct reference to this, of course, is in Romans chapter 14, verses 4 and 5. My apologies to those who know this. I have to just mention it because it's related to the text. Who are you to judge the servant of another to his own master? He stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike, each be convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. Oh, extra biblical holidays! Well, I, I, I grant you, that Easter is not something I would divide over, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians make it clear that Jesus did not die on Good Friday, nor did he raise from the dead on Easter Sunday. That came, of course, from the Quadridecimian Schism, the first uh, Sunday after the vernal equinox, which had been a pagan holiday. And I'll grant you a lot of the traditions of Christmas, like the trees and the mistletoe, these things are of pagan origin. But there are those who will say, we shouldn't observe these days that they're not in Scripture. Yeah, but what do you do with the fact that in the prescribed holy days that God gave Israel through Moses, there was no Purim, and there was no uh, Hanukkah. Yet in John 10, Jesus observed Hanukkah. <laughs> you can't make the arguments some people make. You can't take these arguments to the extremes some people do, thinking that they're right in doing it. However, let's look once more at the text itself. It's warning. What is going to happen? Sabbatarian legalism in verse 16. Then it goes on self-abasement, the worship of angels, or dulia, hyperdulia of Mary, but worship of angels, dulia in Greek, taking his stand on visions he's seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Let's just look. There is only one angel in Scripture who's called an angel who was able to give doctrine. That is the angel of the Lord. Hamalak Adonai is a Christophany who wrestled with Jacob and who appeared to the parents of Samson. Why do you ask my name? It is Pele, as in Pele Owetz, wonderful counselor. That is Jesus, who went before the armies of Israel in Numbers. That is the Lord Jesus. He is the angel of the Lord. 
In Judaism, he is called by the religious Jews the Metatron. Wait a minute. They didn't call him the Metatron, but the angel of the Lord is Christ. Then they have all these pagan versions of the Metatron as well. But the one they call the Metatron, the angel of the Lord, is the Lord Jesus. He wrestled with Jacob. He appeared to the parents of Samuel. He went before the armies of Israel. He is not an angel. He is the angel. It's the angel of the Lord is a Christophany in the Old Testament. Let's go back. Angels, be they cherubs, seraphs, which comes from fire, they never gave doctrine. They only explained it to Daniel and so forth or to John in Revelation. No, that's not how doctrine came. Doctrine can only come from God. Angels are his messengers, but they are not his revelators. They are his messengers, but they are not his revelators. Remember, demons are fallen angels. These principalities, territorial spirits, if you want to call them that, you know, in Ephesians and so forth, these are principal, these are demonic powers. We've talked many times about Daniel 10, the Prince of Persia. These are demonic powers over these nations for sure. Again, related but separate subject. Let's understand why he's warning about those who take their stand on these visions and with an emphasis on the veneration of angels or the worship of angels. Where does the Quran come from? Mohammed claimed that Gabriel, called Jibril in Arabic, appeared to him and gave him the Quran, even though he was illiterate and couldn't write. <laughs> the Hebrew prophets could all read and write. Mohammed couldn't, but the angel came and gave him the Quran. Islam comes from a claimed angelic revelation. That's where it comes from. That's what gave us Islam. That is the source of Islam. Where does Seventh-day Adventists come from? Ellen G. White. She claims an angel appeared to her and pointed out the Tenth Commandment and Sabbatarian legalism and that those who worship on Sunday take the mark of the beast. <laughs> That's what she taught. That was the doctrine. Where did she get this? She said an angel gave it to her. Seventh-day Adventists are based on this. Well, who else? Joseph Smith, and there are contradictory accounts of it, but Joseph Smith with the angel Moroni, the Book of Mormon and these plates and all this nonsense. Where did Mormonism come from? Joseph Smith said he got it from an angel. They all get it from an angel. <laughs> but if they got it from a real angel, it was a fallen one. Either that or they're just con artists. It's a fallen angel. Islam, Mormonism, Seventh-day Adventism, they all come from that. Notice what the Jehovah's Witnesses do with the Lord Jesus. They say he's the angel, Archangel Michael, don't they? <laughs> that when the New Testament was given and the gospel was given, God revealed in the New Covenant through the Archangel Michael. That's what they teach. That's what they teach. The angel. <laughs> it goes on and on. Before the Reformation, there were true believers in England and in Europe, long before Luther and Zwingli and these people, long before it. 
In John Wycliffe's day, they were called the Lollards. In the darkest of the dark ages, there was a move of God among people in England called the Lollards. John Wycliffe put the scriptures into the English language, old English, but put in the English language so the common people could read it. Oh, boy. They criminalized him. They murdered his followers, as you'd expect. But his influence extended into Europe. And among those who were influenced by him were Jan Hus in Bohemia, in, in Prague. Move of God springs up in Central Europe among the Bohemian brethren who the Roman church and others called the Hussites, naming them after Jan Hus. The Roman Catholic church, of course, invited Hus to a debate at Lake Constance, the Bodensee in Germany. When he got there, they broke their word and burned them alive. They said, Holy Mother, the church is not obligated to keep her word to heretics. So that, you know, all these guys who did this, like Hus and, you know, with them, certainly later on with, with William Tyndale, but way before that, before the Reformation, what they did to Savonarola in Italy, what they did, you know, to, to the followers of John Wycliffe, what they did to Jan Hus was terrible. And these guys were growing and gaining momentum, and God was giving them victories. And they would defend themselves after much prayer. They would be outnumbered three to one by professional soldiers, and their little militia of farmers and peasants would win. <laughs> the Lord's hand was on them. The Catholic Church declared a jihad against them. Well, there's a woman in France who claimed the archangel Michael appears to her. And it began when she was a little girl. So did St. Catherine and some other one. But it was mainly Michael. And this is before the Reformation. Michael told her, she says, that the English have to be driven out of France. This is the will of God. And she's going to do it. And she tells people about this. And she wants to make Charles the king of France away from the king of England. So, initially, she has some victories at Orleans, Orléans, in France. But then it all goes pear-shaped. She's defeated in Burgundy. She does not liberate Paris. And she winds up, of course, being put on trial herself and accused of witchcraft and all kinds of... David accused her of cross-dressing. Cross but I, again, digress. What did she want to do when she got control of these armies of France? She told the believers, the saved Christians of the time, she told the Hussites that if you don't come back under the Pope, if you don't return to the Roman papacy and come back under the pontiff, I'm going to wipe you out. I control the armies of France. I will wipe you out. Out unless you return to Roman Catholicism. And when they wiped people out, they killed their children, they killed everything. This was Joan of Arc, an enemy of the gospel, an enemy of the people of Christ. Where did she get this? She said an angel told her. <laughs> Whenever you see this, you got a problem. Remember the man who behaved like a tattooed goon. He had a handicapped wife and three children whom he abandoned, took off with a woman with whom he was in an adulterous relationship, divorces his Christian wife, marries this immoral woman, and then he gets rehabilitated a few weeks later, of course, by Rick Joyner, and now she's prophesying with him. This is Todd Bentley, who was banned from Australia and England. They wouldn't give him a visa because he kicked old ladies in the face on videos. 
Well, where was he getting this stuff he was teaching? He said an angel named Emma was appearing to him. <laughs> now, no place in scripture is there a female angel. When they manifest as human entertaining angels unaware, none of them were ever women. The only place you'll find female angels is in Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism. But he says it was an angel named Emma giving him these revelations. And then later on, after the sex scandal and the divorce, when he gets rehabilitated, after Bill Johnson and Peter Wagner and Che Ahn and Rick Joyner laid hands on him, he said, now is another angel called International Banker. <laughs> That's what he said on television. An angel called International Banker, a female angel called Emma. Whenever you have this, look out. It could be Islam. It happens in Roman Catholicism. It could be Seventh-day Adventism. It could be Mormonism. It could be Todd Bentley's outfit and his NAR, New Apostolic Reformation, sponsors. We are warned against this. It was an issue in the early church. It's been an issue throughout the centuries, and it's an issue now. They take their stand on a vision of angelic revelation. No, they are messengers. They are not revelators. In other words, angels, particularly archangels like Gabriel, gave Daniel understanding of what was revealed but they were not the revelators. God gave him these visions. Angels explained it, but the revelation did not come from the angels. They never come from angels. That's not their function. If they do that, there are angels who Jude says have left their rightful abode. These are not angels. If anything appeared to Joseph Smith and Muhammad, <laughs> it was a demon. Counterfeiting, they come as angels of light. Well, you've got Doreen Virtue. She claims Jesus, not a vision of Jesus, an apparition of Jesus appeared to him. She described him to an artist and had it painted, except there was no stigmata, there was no nail marks. It was a false Jesus. And the scripture tells us Jesus is coming back the way he went. If anyone says, I've returned physically, don't believe it. She believed it. And so did her sponsors. Initially, Justin Peters, <laughs> John MacArthur's right-hand man, uh, Phil Johnson, J.D. Hall, and above all, above all, Chris Roseborough. They're promoting this thing. Once more, these are people who are cessationists. They are against any kind of charismatic phenomena. They claim to be against visions and apparitions. But they fell for one, and they propagated it. The very people who are anti-charismatic cessationists, who are opposed to continuationism of the spiritual gifts, went with this woman. Finally, after writing four books, she agreed it was demonic. But that didn't stop her from writing a fifth book, promoting what she admitted was a demonic vision. And it didn't stop Chris Roseborough from continuing to promote her. You have to understand this stuff is demonic. That's the reason they hate myself and Moriel and Service Christie and stuff, they're, they're demonically controlled. They're deceived. How can people who, and John MacArthur can't believe something like that, like this crazy woman, a Christ that was not even crucified? Roseboro has a statue of a Jesus, again, that was never crucified in his church, and he prays, prays to it, prays in front of them. We have pictures. Unbelievable. 
It's the very thing Colossians warned about. They take their stand on a vision. The scriptures are complete canon. A complete canon. The Hebrew word for vision is chazon. The Greek word uh, for revelation is apocalypsis. Okay. There's no new doctrine. It's all there. There's a clearer understanding of what's already in there. There'll be a clearer understanding as, as, the, as the curtain goes up. But there's no new doctrine. You see people going around basing doctrine on visions and apparitions. You know the devil is in control of what they're doing. But look how high it's gotten. It's gotten into John MacArthur's office. Go on into that and watch it. Phil Johnson takes this woman who has this uncrucified Jesus appearing to her, and she was a New Age sorceress who claims to have gotten saved through this. Phil Johnson uses this woman to defend John MacArthur's teaching that it will be possible to take the mark of the beast and still be saved. That's who MacArthur's people get to defend MacArthur. This woman who had this apparition of a Jesus who was never crucified. You couldn't make this stuff up. Let's look. Watch out for that stuff. Keep away. Let no one defraud you. These people are into self-abasement. They take their stands on these visions. They're inflated without cause by their fleshly mind, like Doreen Virtue. Not holding to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with a growth, which is from God. In other words, those who do this, those who do what Roseboro does and what Doreen Virtue does and what the, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and the Muslims, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they say they're born again. If they do this, they are not, decisively not, under the headship of Jesus Christ. They are not under the headship of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine a member of your body anatomically not controlled by the brain? Well, that's what these things are. They may be in the church. They may say they're part of the body of Christ, but they're not controlled by the head. This is frightening. And you see how it's, it's setting the stage for what the Antichrist is going to do. He is going to deceive these kinds of believers. He is going to deceive people. Like, like MacArthur, you can take the mark of the beast. And then they defend him, and they get this crazy woman who has apparitions to defend MacArthur. That's his This is crazy. But it goes on. If you died to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? Now, this obviously alludes to Judaizers, those trying to put believers under the law. This is similar to Galatians, obviously. But let's look at it. Which all refer to things destined to perish with use. In accordance with the commandments and teachings of men. In Jesus' day, he contended with this. It was the tradition of the elders. The tradition of the elders, which were later codified into the Mishnah and Gemorah. 
and then the Halakha and the Shulchan Aruch. But that was the beginning of it, the tradition of the elders. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. No value. They're useless. They are religion. They are not Christianity. It is man's concept of discipline, not God's. It's man's philosophy. It's not God's theology. Do not touch, do not handle, do not taste, do rules. One of the evangelical denominations that has gone the furthest into liberalism has been the Church of the Nazarene. How did it happen? They were so strict. They had a rule book the size of the London Yellow Pages. You couldn't go to the circus because the girls who ride the elephants wear skimpy costumes and it might provoke lust. This is what they do. This is <laughs> and as long as you were keeping all these rules, you were... <laughs> well, <laughs> these things for sure have the appearance, but they do nothing. They do nothing. You had Kent from the Nazarene sign the agreement with the Roman church, you had uh, this guy passing out condoms uh, uh, who's a Nazarene uh, uh, to, to unmarried couples to fight AIDS. It's unbelievable. There's no moral morality. Do not taste, do not handle, do not touch. The Roman Catholic prohibitions on marriage for the clergy. Paul says there are doctrine of demons in Timothy. No, you don't Go near women sexually, or you don't get romantically attracted to, to members of the opposite sex. You don't go near men. You don't. No, you molest children. These things have the appearance of religiosity, but they are useless. Useless. I don't need a rule book to tell me to avoid things that can provoke me to lust. If I'm watching something news on the internet and something comes on that is immoral, I've got the Holy Spirit to tell me, flee youthful lust, not that I'm youthful anymore. Now that'll work. That'll work. I only speak personally. When I wake up in the morning, you know, and I guess I've still got some testosterone left. My head begins to wonder, what do I do? The lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life said, Libra no malo, deliver us from evil. Now that'll work. That does work. But these decrees don't work. And some of the stuff they restrict is ridiculous. They're as ridiculous as the world. The world is banning the, the, the Muppets <laughs> and Dr. Seuss because they say it's racist. It's just absolute madness. Well, religion can be just as mad. You want to see people who are bordering on madness? Look at Hasidic Jews. Look at the Amish people in Pennsylvania. There's a false sense of security and salvation because of the rule keeping. Oh, they look like it's going to work, but they don't. The Amish have a thing called Rumspringer. They actually allow young people to go out into the English speaking world and have a fling and decide if they want to be Amish or not. <laughs> That's their Rumspringer. They speak high German. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The pedophilia in the Roman church, it's unbelievable. And the hierarchy protected it, it's unbelievable. Oh, these things look religious. 
cloisterism and celibacy and uh, they don't work. They've never worked. And they're never going to work. The world's idea of discipline doesn't work. It says in Romans, the law provokes us. The most you're going to do is get people not to do something out of fear of incrimination, but it's not going to stop people from desiring to do it. <laughs> as far as God's concerned, if you desire to do it, it's as bad as doing it. Well, it doesn't work. Religion doesn't work. Discipline as the world defines it doesn't work. The gospel works. Discipleship, God's version of discipline works. Religion doesn't work. When you see this kind of religiosity, what you are seeing are the vain philosophies of the world getting into the church. And there's going to be self-abasement. Somebody is going to be a cultic figure who's going to be lifted up. Always the same. It doesn't matter if the Islam or the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, they, they all do it. And it caused Paul agony. Even then, even in the first century, locked up in a Roman prison, he was agonizing over this. He could handle his own situation. But when he saw believers in danger of being taken captive by the stuff, it caused him nothing but agony. Well, it should still be causing us nothing but agony. These things are agonizing. Deadly. And as we get closer to the return of Christ, they will increase. No. The philosophies of the world. Religion is just a philosophy masquerading as a theology. That's all. It doesn't matter if it's extreme access of reformed Calvinism, a humanism, a higher criticism of German rationalism. It doesn't matter if it's Aristotelianism or if it's Platonic 19th century German rationalism. It, the philosophies masquerading as Christianity. No, 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 no. We don't need the philosophies of men taught by unprincipled men. We need the theology of Jesus. We look at him. Colossians is about Christ in his relationship to the church. Colossians 2 was a very, very important chapter for the age and time and circumstances in which we live. I would encourage you to read it often. Thank you so much for listening. If you are in the United States, we'll be continuing looking at the book of Jonah on Saturday, uh, which will be 11 o'clock p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, this is obviously earlier for people who are in Britain and Ireland and Europe, but it will be, uh, there's an hour, another hour difference now. Uh, in the United States, it'll be, uh, I think it's going to be, 4 p.m. California, 5 p.m. Rocky Mountains, 6 p.m. in Chicago, and 7 in New York. Australia, it'll be early in the morning, 7 in Western Australia and Singapore on Sunday morning. And then it will be 10, I think, 10 in Sydney, Melbourne, and then around noontime in, in New Zealand. Uh, but for people in North America, we look forward to seeing you Friday. And if you drank too much coffee and can't get to sleep on, on I'm sorry, on Saturday, and you're in England and you're, you're a night owl, you drank too much caffeine, please join us at 11 o'clock 
Greenwich Mean Time, we'll be looking at the book of Jonah, re-recording and updating older teaching. Meanwhile, we'll continue, Lord willing, next week on Wednesday, same time, with the book of Colossians. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm all in green today, and I'm again wishing our viewers in the Republic of Ireland a very, very happy St. Patrick's Day. Good night, Bohadat. And to our friends, our Fenian friends up the falls and in Anderson Town, Chukyala. Uh, but to all of our Irish friends, Salan August Banacht. Thank you so much. Gormahagat. Thank you so much, Jacob. Sure appreciate that uh, great teaching. Um, do you have time for a couple of questions or? If they're relevant, relevant. They're related to what we looked at tonight. Okay. Uh, Steve, did you have a, um, a question? You still have the hand up. Are you there? No? Okay. What about Steve you, Esther? Down. You left in protest. What about, <laughs> what about you, Esther? He's oh. gone down to the novena. <laughs> She's gone, too. Okay. Um, if anybody, you could put a yellow hand up that if you have yes. a question, that would be great. If anybody has a question, just let, uh, put that yellow hand up and I'll unmute you. There you, you go. Sarah there Leslie's got one. Cheney's got one. He, Bill and Yvette, Noah. Several of them. Here comes your mic. Unmute, Sarah. Okay. There you go. All right. All right. I'm green, too. I didn't know you were a Mick. Am I a what? <laughs> my, my mother's family is Irish, but you're wearing green, too. I didn't know you were Hey, Irish. hey, hey. Yeah, I got Irish in me. Yeah, yeah. Confirmed by one of my kids' genetic tests. So, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm almost 50 years in the Lord this year, coming Praise out of the God hippie movement. That. Huh? Praise God for that. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I should be dead and I'm alive. So, I mean, literally, I should be dead, but I'm alive. Um, the, the thing you brought up about these apparitions of Jesus, you know, that was an issue back even in the hippie movement. And um, I cannot, I, I've spent 50 years studying it. I cannot find any scriptural support for actually seeing a Jesus apparition. Okay. We have to draw a distinction between a vision and an apparition. Paul okay. had a vision. Stephen had a vision. Yeah. But whenever there was a post-ascension, post-Pentecost vision of Jesus, he was in heaven. At the right hand of the Father. That's right. Never on earth. When you say he returns to earth, that's an apparition. And that's the very thing he right. warned about. They say he's in the wilderness, don't go there. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. And that's what Doreen Virtue and Chris right. Rosebro and these guys are promoting. Yeah. That's what they were promoting. They, they were promoting an apparition of a false Christ. Yeah, this is this is what Paul Yonggi Cho claimed. That Jesus yeah. came to his bedroom. He's another one. Yeah. <laughs> You know, well, everybody that I ever encountered that said that they had actually seen Jesus, either they quickly fell away from the faith or they quickly fell into error. But none of them are standing with us today, nope. 50 years nope. later. Nope. Look, I got, look, there is scriptural basis for visions, but they're rare. rare. But apparitions, zero. He's coming back the way he left. If anybody says he comes back, get away from them. And that includes transubstantiation and the Roman Eucharist. They claim that's yeah. the physical return of Jesus protoplasmically. It's idolatry. Get away from it. Um, Noah, did you have a question? Unmute. You have to unmute, unmute there. Here, Noah. There you go. Yes. There you are. Hey, I had a question. Uh, Jacob was talking about the thunderings, the peals of thunder, seven peals of thunder in Revelation. And I was wanting to see if that was maybe in some way related to John 12, 28 where Christ says, Father, glorify your name. 
and then a voice comes out of heaven. Yes, yes, that's that. It does relate to that. Yes. And some heard thunder, some heard Correct. maybe an angel, but then the disciples, I guess, heard the voice. Can that you comment correct. maybe a little bit on that? That's correct. You are correct. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Cheney and uh, Bill and Yvette. Yeah, Cheney, uh, you want, oh, did you unmute your mic? Yes, you did. Got a question? Well, my question is um, in regards to worship of angels. Um, um, I know Paul um, Paul in, uh, was it first, first Timothy four, where it talks about doctrines of demons. Yes. Would, would you, would you parallel that with the worship of angels? Well, if, again, if a doctrinal revelation comes by an angel, mm -hmm. it is a false doctrine and that right. is an, it, it is a fallen angel. Okay. Right. The doctrine Amen. of demons. So if right. somebody is claiming a doctrine of revelation from an angel, it's, right. a, it's a fallen angel, and it's a false doctrine. Amen. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, Bill, you had a question. Unmute. You gotta unmute yourself, Bill. All hey, right. You hear me? I yep. can hear you. All right. My question. Um, if I may, it's from verse 24 of chapter 1. And what does Paul mean when he says that he is filling up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions? Because we all know that Christ's work was complete on the cross when he said, to less die. And yes. so I don't understand why Paul says, I, I, I'm having to take up the slack, more or less, for what was okay. lacking in what Christ did. Okay, I will explain. Affliction is not the same as Jesus taking our sin. Job suffered affliction. Jeremiah suffered affliction. Paul suffered affliction. Believers can still suffer affliction, and they are sharing in the burden of Jesus. In the case of Paul, he was participating in the burden of Jesus concerning what was happening to his body, the church. He was agonizing over it. He was, that is the affliction, okay? That is not the same as imputing sin. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. That explains okay. it. Um, Andrew, you said you had a question? You'll have to unmute. Where is he? Got to ask him to unmute. Uh, I already did that. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, it was more of a question about. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if you can apply Jacob also in re in relation to what you said with human philosophies and and uh, things that have crept into the church uh, unawares. Uh, can someone use Jude one uh, the the epistle of Jude one four to whereby Paul says that uh, certain men have crept in unawares. Uh, These are false believers who defile the Lord's table in, in Jude. Uh, I'm, not on this, I'm not sure I understand your question. Uh, yeah, well, uh, with regards to the likes of Rick Joyner that you mentioned. Oh, yes, know. absolutely. False uh, brethren getting into the church. Yes. But Jude, Jude describes a specific kind of them. Jude is not so much dealing with their philosophies or doctrines. He's dealing with their behavior. Waterless clouds twice dead. You know, well, they were alive once, but then they're dead again. Uh, we have a great cloud of witnesses. Well, they're a witness, but there's no water. There's no Holy Spirit in it. You know, he describes what they are. He says that they 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 wander about. like they, they go from church to church, fellowship to fellowship, spreading poison. You know, he describes their behavior patterns. Okay. Yeah. That's Jude. Yeah. Um, one more question. Uh, Eric, you had a question. You'll have to unmute. Yes. Thank you, Jacob, for the teaching uh, this afternoon here in the U.S. Um, given the fact that in uh, Colossians, Colossae, 
there was a lot of philosophy going on in that society. Um, you see when Paul says basically the philosophies of the world, but he also alludes to Judaizers as well. Yes, so, we, as we pointed that out, yes. And the church having to contend with both type of doctrines, doctrines yes. of the world through philosophy and Judaizers. Are we seeing the same type of thing now billowing up in the last day to come against the true body of Christ, even well, within sure. politics? Sure. Well, even let's look at the Judaizers. Within politics. Let's look at the Judaizers. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Branch Davidian cult in Waco, Texas that time, or if you look at Seventh-day Adventism, mm -hmm. or if you look at the extreme access of the modern Messianic movement or putting people in bondage to the law, those people are Judaizers. They're doing what Galatians warned against. They're around, and their numbers have increased, absolutely. Um, Satan has infiltrated the Messianic movement, and, and these people are all over the place. Pushing Torah observance is something mandatory for, if not salvation, certainly for consecration. Um, definitely, definitely. But the Seventh-day Adventists would be the colossal example in the Western world of, of, of Judaized Christianity with the dietary laws and, and Sabbatarian legalism, et cetera. And we yeah. see on the, on the philosophical side, the politicians, particularly in the West, really appealing to philosophy, such as the and humanism. And it looks like the verging of false religion and, and, and politics, you know, philosophy. Yeah. Like yeah. The, 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 the marriage of new age, yeah, of okay, of new age, and postmodernism. Yes, that's what you're seeing. Yes, and it will express itself socially, culturally, and politically. Yes. Yep, that's what's going on. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jacob. Um, I'm going to open up the mics, and people can uh, have fellowship now. We sure appreciate you coming, and hope you'll come back on Wednesday and also Saturday. And I'll be sending out a flyer to that effect. If you haven't signed up, go sign up for uh, Be Alert and you'll get the, the alerts as well. Yes, sign up for Be Alert if you don't get it, please. Yep. We announce a lot of things. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. God bless. Have thank a good you. Night. Bless Happy you too. Happy, Happy you, Jacob. Jacob. Thank you, Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. For more information about Moriel, check out our website www.moriel.org.